Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This morning, CPSC staff will brief the Commission on two draft notices of proposed rulemaking that together would establish safety standards for all window coverings sold to consumers. We were briefed yesterday on a draft proposal on magnets and have two more of these briefings coming up this month. And I appreciate all the hard work staff has put, done to put together these packages. The draft rules uh, we're going to be briefed on today attempt to address the horrific tragedy of babies and small children strangled on window cords. According to staff, on average, nine children strangle to death on window cords each year. These two draft proposals reflect changes in the marketplace, industries, and CPSC issues, and advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on window coverings in 2016. In that time, ANSI has developed the uh, American National Standard for Safety of Corded Window Covering Products. Staff will present two proposals. First, a draft proposed rulemaking under Section 15J of the Consumer Product Safety Act to deem that window covers do not meet the requirements of the ANSI standard uh, presents a substantial product hazard. Second proposal is a draft notice of rulemaking under Section 9, uh, 7 and 9 of CPSA to establish a safety standard for operating cords for custom window coverings, a safety gap that was left by the voluntary standards. I know that we have questions for the staff, so I'll turn it over to them to brief us. Once we have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of staff with multiple rounds necessary. The following staff members will brief the commission. Uh, Dr. Rana Balaji Sinha, uh, Division Director for Human Factors within the Directorate for Engineering Sciences and Project Manager for Window Coverings, and uh, Mary House, Attorney in the Regulatory Affairs Division of the Office of General Counsel. Office, also in attendance are Mary Boyle, the CPSC Executive Director, Pamela Stone, Acting General Counsel, and Avi Mosham, who is acting for Roberta Mills, our CPSC Secretary. One final point before I start to turn the meeting over to staff, any questions of staff to address the agency's legal authority should be withheld until the closed executive session, which will follow directly after this public briefing. Thank you. I turn the gavel now over to um, Dr. Balaji Singha uh, and Ms. House. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, commissioners. As the chair stated, Mary House and I will be presenting two notices of proposed rulemaking associated with corded window coverings. Next slide, please. We will structure the presentation so that the common information is presented first. We will start with the product category, hazard scenarios, incident data, injury severity, and nature of incidents. We will then talk about CPSC history, followed by voluntary standard activities, including the adequacy of the standard and its compliance by the industry. Then we will discuss the statutory framework for a rule under Section 15J of the Consumer Product Safety Act, CPSA, followed by explaining the recommended requirements for a Section 15J rule. We will then explain the statutory framework for a rule under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA, followed by explaining the recommended requirements for a Section 7 and 9 rule. Next slide, please. Window coverings comprise a wide range of products, including shades, blinds, curtains, and draperies. In general, hard window coverings composed of slats or veins are considered blinds, and soft window coverings that contain a continuous roll of material are considered shades. On this slide, from left to right, we are showing a horizontal blind, a vertical blind, a roll-up shade, a cellular shade, and a Roman shade. Next slide, please. The user manipulates the operating cords that you see on the right side to raise or lower the window covering. Operating cords can be in the form of operating pull cords, as shown here, or in a continuous loop form. The inner cords are not directly manipulated by the user, but transfer the force resulting from a user pulling on the operating cords or from the user operating a wand or some other non-corded component to lift the bottom rail up. 
Operating cords, as well as inner cords, have been involved in strangulation deaths of children. Next slide. Here are some examples of children getting entangled in the cords. The continuous loops and lifting loops that you see on the left are pre-existing loops that the child can insert their head through. For operating pull cords, two kinds of strangulation can occur. One is when child wraps the cord around their neck, and the other is when the child inserts their head to a loop, usually resulting from tangled pull cords. Next slide. In terms of incident data, based on a review of the data from National Center for Health Statistics and a separate CPSC study on child strangulations, we estimate that a minimum of nine fatal strangulations related to window covering cords have occurred per year in the United States among children under five years and younger from 2009 through 2019. We also estimate that based on CPSC's injury cost model, that approximately 185 medically treated non-fatal injuries have occurred annually from 2009 through 2020, involving children eight years and younger. In terms of reported incidents, we have received 194 fatal and non-fatal strangulation reports among children eight years and younger, from January 2009 through December 2020. 89 incident reports describe a fatality, while the remaining were non-fatal incidents. Next slide. Strangulation due to mechanical compression of the neck is a complex process, resulting from obstruction of the airway passage and occlusion of blood vessels in the neck. If sustained lateral pressure occurs at a level resulting in vascular occlusion, Strangulation can occur even in situations where the child's body is fully or partially supported. Some of the reported non-fatal incidents involved severe injuries with long-term consequences, such as permanent brain damage. Strangulation is a form of asphyxia that can be partial when there is an inadequate oxygen supply to the lungs or total when there is complete impairment of oxygen transport to tissues. A reduction in the delivery of oxygen to tissues can result in permanent irreversible damage. Experimental studies show that about 4.4 pounds of pressure on the neck may occlude the jugular vein and 7 to 11 pounds may occlude the common carotid arteries. Minimal compression of any of these vessels can lead to unconsciousness within 15 seconds and death in two to three minutes. Next. CPSC has recognized cords on window coverings as a hidden hazard for many years. Strangulation with cords require only a few minutes and it is silent because even young children are left unsupervised for a few minutes or more in a room that is considered safe, such as a bedroom or a family room. Staff concluded that parental supervision is unlikely to be effective. Warning labels also have limited effectiveness because research demonstrates that consumers are less likely to look for and read safety information about the products that they use frequently and are familiar with. Consumers are very likely to have familiarity with window coverings because they almost certainly have window coverings in their homes and probably use them daily. Therefore, even well-designed warning labels will have limited effectiveness in communicating the hazard on this type of product. Safety devices such as cord cleats and tension devices are unlikely to be effective either. Cord cleats need to be attached to the wall and caregivers must wrap the cord around the cleat every time window covering is raised or lowered. As incident data show, children can still access and entangle into cords. Tension devices also need to be attached to the wall or window sill, which may not occur due to increased cost of compliance, that is time and effort required to install the device, an unwillingness to create holes in the wall, and may not be permissible in rental homes. Depending on how taut the cord loop is, the cord loop can still allow a child's head to enter to the opening as observed in the incident data. Next, please. Since the mid-1990s, CPSC staff has been working with the Window Covering Manufacturers Association, or WCMA, that represents the interests of window covering industry manufacturers, fabricators, and assemblers. 
WCMA is a standard developing organization accredited by the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. In 2013, CPSC received a petition requesting a rule to prohibit any window covering cords where a feasible cordless alternative exists. And for those instances where a feasible alternative does not exist, require that all cords be made inaccessible through the use of passive guarding devices. Commission granted the petition in October 2014, instructed the staff to begin rulemaking. In January 2015, Commission voted to approve publication of the AMPR in the Federal Register. Following the publication of the AMPR, Commission received comments from 1,013 people or entities. Next, please. From January 1, 2009 through December 2020, CPSC conducted 42 window covering product recalls. More than 28 million units were recalled and included stock as well as custom products. Recalled products were associated with 14 deaths and 31 near strangulations. Next. The ANSI standard for the safety of corded window covering products was first published in 1996 and aimed to address strangulation incidents created by looped cords. In 2002, the standard was revised to require inner cord stops to reduce the risk associated with inner cords. The standard was revised five times between 2007 and 2014 and included requirements related to tension devices to partially limit the consumer's ability to control the blind if the tension device is not properly installed requirements related to Roman shade inner cords, warning labels and pictograms on the outside of stock packaging, hazardous loop testing, roll-up style shape performance and durability of all safety devices. CPSC staff has been involved in all of these incremental improvements to the voluntary standard. However, until the 2018 version, staff found that the requirements were inadequate to address the risk of injury. For example, in the ANPR, staff concluded that at least 57% of the incidents that occurred could still occur with pull cords and continuous loops on window coverings even if the product met the standard. The current version of the standard was published in 2018. This version segments the window covering market between stock and custom-made products. The standard makes substantial improvements to effectively address the strangulation risk associated with operating and inner cords on stock window coverings. Many of the public comments that were received to, in response to the ANPR were addressed by the 2018 version of the standard and corresponding changes to stock products. All window coverings manufactured after December 15, 2018 must meet the new standard. Next. A stock window covering is defined in the 2018 standard as a completely or substantially fabricated product prior to being distributed in commerce. Even when the seller, manufacturer or distributor modifies a pre-assembled product by adjusting to size or attaching the top rail or bottom rail, the product is still considered stock. Online sales of a product or the size of an order such as a multifamily housing order do not make the product a non-stock product. The standard provides these examples to clarify that as long as the product is substantially fabricated, subsequent changes to the product do not change its categorization. Next. Staff uses the term custom window covering in the draft proposed rule as described in the ANSI standard for custom blinds, shades and shadings which are defined as any window covering that is not classified as a stock window covering. Next. So per the standard, stock products are required to have no operating cords as seen on the picture on the left, or have short cords that are a maximum eight inches long as shown in the middle picture, or have inaccessible operating cords as shown on the right. Having no operating cords effectively eliminates the strangulation hazard because there is no operating cord to cause strangulation. If the length of the operating cord is eight inches or shorter in any state, free or under tension, 
based on the anthropometric dimensions of youngest children involved in the incidents, it is not sufficient to strangle a child. Therefore, staff finds this requirement also adequate. If the window of covering utilizes a device, such as a rigid cord shroud, as shown in the picture on the right, to make the cord inaccessible, this also addresses the strangulation hazard by adequately preventing access to the cord. Next. Staff assessed that stock window covering requirements for operating cords in the voluntary standard are adequate to address the risk of strangulation. Where known, stock window coverings accounted for 59% of all incidents and 58% of all fatal incidents. We could identify 50 incidents involving stock window coverings and 29 involved operating pull cords, continuous loop operating cords, or tilt cords. Staff concluded that if the incident stock products met the current voluntary standard, all of the 29 incidents would have been prevented. Next. For custom ordered window covering products, the products can follow the operating core requirement for stock products per the standard, or consumers can purchase window coverings with accessible and hazardous operating cords. The 2018 standard contains revised requirements for custom ordered products, including operating cords that have a default length of 40% of the blind height that was previously unlimited. A wand to be the default option to tilt the slats instead of the cord. However, the length of the operating cords can still be hazardous when the product is fully lowered because the child can still wrap the cord around their neck. Multiple cords can still entangle and create a loop in which a child can insert their head. Operating cords will also get longer as the window covering is raised, making it easier for the child to access and manipulate. If the cord tilt option is chosen, the cord tilt can also be long enough to be wrapped around the child's neck or be tangled and create a loop in which a child's head can enter. The default options can also be changed during the custom order process, allowing long and accessible cords. Next. Staff concluded that the requirements for operating cords on custom window coverings do not adequately address the strangulation risk. Where known, custom window coverings accounted for 41% of all incidents and 42% of fatal incidents. We identified 35 custom window covering incidents and 30 of 35 involved operating pull cords or continuous loop operating cords. All 30 of 35 custom product incidents can still occur even if the product complied with the voluntary standard. Although the NCWCMA 2018 standard divides the window covering market into two uh, categories, stock and custom products, incident scenarios are not based on this product distinction. Fatal and non-fatal injuries associated with window covering cords do not distinguish between stock and custom products because both types of products essentially have the same hazard patterns. Next. The fact that the hazard, hazard scenarios are the same for both stock and custom window coverings is acknowledged in the ANSI standard in terms of inner cords. As described earlier, inner cords run through the window covering and pull the bottom rail up when the user pulls the operating cords. Inner cords can pose a strangulation hazard if the child pulls on the inner cord and then places their head into the loop. The volunteer standard has two testing requirements to confirm the safety of inner cords that apply to both stock and custom products. First, the inner cords are tested for accessibility using a cord accessibility probe. If cords are accessible, we then test whether the cord presents a hazard by pulling the inner cord with a maximum force of five pounds, followed by an attempt to insert the head probe into the opening with a maximum force of 10 pounds. Inner cords that are inaccessible or that do not allow a head probe to go through the opening are compliant with the ANSI standard 
and adequately address the strangulation hazard associated with intercourse. Next. Staff identified 22 intercourt incidents out of 194 incidents involving stock, custom, or unknown, whether it is stock or custom product type. Regardless of product type, we concluded that all 22 incidents would have been prevented if the window covering met the 2018 standard. Next. Staff on a preliminary basis assess that there is substantial compliance with the voluntary standard based on the following. WCMA stated in its comment to the AMPR that there has been substantial compliance among manufacturers with the standard since its first publication. WCMA also stated that association's message to all manufacturers is that compliance with the standard is mandatory to sell window coverings in the United States. To investigate the level of compliance, CPSD contracted with DNR International, who interviewed window covering manufacturers and component manufacturers. Manufacturers indicated retail customers would not stock non-compliant products. Manufacturers are also aware of their customers' procedures and would not ship to them if there were concerns about the assembly and installation process. All manufacturers interviewed were aware of the standard and had implemented compliance in all stages of their development process. In addition, CPSC field staff confirmed compliance of the product categorization for stock and custom by conducting unannounced in-store visits to 18 firms comprising wholesalers, manufacturers, and retailers. 13 locations demonstrated compliance with the voluntary standard in terms of operating courts for both stock and custom products. In four locations, we have observed non-compliance of the custom products. Primary violations included operating pull cords longer than 40% of the window covering length, when the window covering was fully lowered without an accompanying specific customer request, lack of warning label or a manufacturer label or a hang tag, and use of court tilt instead of wand tilt without an accompanying customer request. Staff found one location with a non-compliant stock product. Based on CPSC staff's review of market information and contractor report findings and WCMA statements, staff concluded that a substantial majority of stock window coverings sold in the United States conform to 2018 standard. Samples tested by CPSC staff also indicate a high level of conformance in custom products related to inner court accessibility. Next. Now Mary is going to review the statutory framework for the first draft rule. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. I have prepared two NPRs on window covering cords for the Commission's consideration. Taken together, the intent is for the draft rules to address the risk of strangulation to young children associated with operating and inner cords on stock and custom window coverings. The first NPR covers the hazards highlighted in the blue boxes on this slide. This draft NPR uses the Commission's authority in Section 15J of the CPSA. This type of rule is not a consumer product safety rule. Rather, the rule would make non-compliance with certain parts of the ANCW-CMA standard a Commission-determined substantial product hazard, FPH, it's defined under Section 15A2 of the CPSA. Products that present an SPH under the CPSA are subject to corrective action. A manufacturer, importer, distributor, or retailer that fails to report an SPH to the Commission is also subject to potential civil and criminal penalties under the CPSA. And products that present an SPH can also be refused admission into the U.S. under Section 17A of the CPSA. The 15J rule would apply to those hazards that staff assesses are adequately addressed by the voluntary standards. Operating cords on stock products, inner cords on stock and custom window coverings, and the manufacturer label on both stock and custom window coverings. The second NPR addresses operating cords on custom window coverings. That's the red box on this slide. This rule relies on the Commission's authority under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA. 
and would create a new mandatory consumer product safety rule for operating cords on custom window coverings. It finalized products subject to this consumer product safety rule. In addition to the things I just went over with the SPH, these products would also need to be tested and certified as compliant with the rule. The proposed requirement would state that operating cords on custom window coverings must meet the same performance requirements in the voluntary standard as operating cords on stock products. Next. The Commission's authority under Section 15J provides a way for the Commission to determine through rulemaking that the presence or absence of certain product characteristics are a substantial product hazard under Section 15A2 of the CPSA. Section 15A2 of the CPSA defines an SPH as a product defect that, because of the pattern of defect, the number of defective products distributed in commerce, the severity of the risk, or otherwise creates a substantial risk of injury to the public. Next slide. To issue an NPR under Section 15J, based on the information and analysis from the staff, the Commission must make four preliminary determinations. The hazard characteristics must be readily observable. The hazards must be addressed by a voluntary standard. The voluntary standard must be effective in reducing the risk of injury. And the products must be in substantial compliance with the voluntary standard. Next slide. The draft NPR proposes to amend the substantial product hazard list, which is codified at 16 CFR Part 1120. Proposed sections 1120.2 F and G of the draft NPR define stock and custom window coverings as they're defined in the voluntary standard. Proposed section 1120.3 E would require stock window coverings to meet the same requirements in the voluntary standards for operating cords, inner cords, and the manufacturer label, all of which are readily observable characteristics of stock window coverings that are addressed in the ANSI standard. Proposed section 1120.3F would require custom window coverings to meet the inner cord and manufacturer label requirements in the ANC standard. Rana is now going to review how the draft rule under section 15J meets the four statutory requirements for this type of rulemaking. Staff is recommending that hazardous operating cords and hazardous inner cords on stock window coverings and hazardous inner cords on custom window coverings be identified as substantial product hazards, along with the absence of a manufacturer label. Staff advises that the Commission can make the four preliminary determinations for 15J because the hazards associated with window covering cords are readily observable, requiring a visual observation and or a measurement. The 2018 standard that sets forth these requirements adequately addresses the strangulation hazard and is effective to reduce the risk of injury. As noted previously, if stock window coverings had been compliant with the ANSI standard, all stock incidents would have been prevented. And if custom window coverings had been compliant with the inner court requirements, inner court incidents would have been prevented. Finally, for the NPR, Staff believes that the Commission can determine on a preliminary basis that window coverings substantially comply with the standard based on contractor findings, staff's assessment of samples on the market, and WCMA's statements. Next. The first readily observable characteristic that I will discuss is the operating court requirements for stock products. Staff can quickly evaluate whether a stock window covering complies with the operating cord requirement in the voluntary standard, usually with just visual observation and a tape measure. Next. For example, staff can visually observe whether a product has operating cords, and if so, whether the cord is accessible. For products that have operating cords, the voluntary standard requires that they be inaccessible or short. Typically, staff can observe whether the operating cords cord are accessible to children upon visual inspection. If the product uses a device, such as a rigid cord shroud, to make the cord inaccessible, shown in the middle picture, the voluntary standard requires a cord shroud accessibility probe 
intended to simulate the finger size of a young child to be used. If the probe cannot touch the cord, then the cord is then deemed inaccessible. Finally, staff can visually observe whether an accessible cord meets the requirement and voluntary standard for a short cord by measuring the length of the cord with a tape measure to determine if the cord is maximum eight inches long. Next. The second readily observable characteristic is the determination of hazardous inner cords. Like the operating cord requirements, staff can quickly evaluate whether stock and custom window coverings comply with the inner cord requirement in the voluntary standard with a visual observation and a measurement. Next. Staff can visually observe whether a window covering has inner cords. Having no inner cords, such as in a roller shade shown on the left, basically eliminates strangulation risk due to inner cords. Staff can sometimes visually assess accessibility of inner cords if the product is an open construction, like a horizontal blind, but may need to use a cord accessibility probe, like the one in the picture in the middle, to determine whether a child can access the inner cord in a closed construction, such as a cellular shade. The test is simple. Staff tries to touch the inner cord with the probe. If the probe can touch the cord, then the cord is accessible. If not, the cord is inaccessible. If the inner cord is accessible, then we would make one more observation to check whether the cord, if pulled at five pounds, creates a loop large enough for the child's head to go through with nine pounds, with 10 pounds of force. Pursuant to the voluntary standard, staff would determine this by inserting a head probe representing anthropometrically correct size of a child's head or simply measuring the circumference of the loop. We will show a brief video that goes through these observations at the end of the presentation. Next. The third readily observable characteristic is a label that includes the name, city, and state of the manufacturer, importer, or fabricator, month and year of manufacture, and designation of the product as stock or custom. The absence of this label constitutes a substantial product hazard because the lack of the label makes it difficult for staff, manufacturers, and consumers to identify the product or class of products that may be subject to a recall and to distinguish stock from custom products. Differentiating stock from custom products is important as long as the operating cord requirements for these products are not identical. Next. Staff from Directorate for Economic Analysis investigated the potential effects of a proposed rule on small entities. Staff determined that a proposed rule designating stock window covering products that do not conform to the 2018 standard and custom window covering products not conforming to the inner court provisions in the 2018 standard as substantial product hazards will not likely have a significant impact on a substantial number of small businesses and other small entities. Data collected in person at manufacturers, retailers, and importers by CPSC staff indicates that the level of conformance with the sections of the WCMA standard concerning stock products is high and most likely greater than 90%. Samples tested by CPSC staff also indicate a high level of conformance in custom products related to inner court accessibility. Firms already conforming to the standard would experience no impact by the proposed rule. At least one small manufacturer that does not currently conform to the stock product requirements will experience a significant cost impact by the rule. Staff does not believe that a substantial number of small manufacturers will experience this cost impact. Based on the available information, the Commission could certify that the draft proposed rule to deem non-conforming operating cords and inner cords on stock products and inner cords on custom products to be substantial product hazards would likely not have a significant impact on a substantial number of small businesses or other small entities. Staff advises collecting comments on this issue and certifying no substantial impact at the final rule stage if the Commission does not receive adverse comments. Next. So CPSC staff recommends that the Commission publish an NPR as prepared by the OGC under Section 15J of the CPSA, 
to deem that stock window coverings that do not comply with the requirements in the ANSI 2018 standard for operating courts and inner courts and custom window coverings that do not comply with the requirements for inner courts presents a substantial product hazard. CPSC staff identified readily observable safety characteristics on stock and custom window coverings, namely the presence of hazardous operating courts and inner courts for stock window coverings and presence of hazardous inner courts for custom window coverings. The presence of hazardous courts on these products, as well as the absence of an on-product manufacturer label, constitute a substantial product hazard. Hazardous operating courts and inner courts on stock window coverings and hazardous inner courts on custom window coverings are adequately addressed in the voluntary standard NCWCMA 2018. Based on a study and staff's additional assessment of the market, CPSC staff advises that stock and custom window coverings likely substantially comply with the voluntary standard. Staff recommends that the Commission publish a proposed rule to list the substantial product hazards, stock window covering products that contain one or more readily observable characteristic, which is hazardous operating courts and hazardous inner courts, and custom window covering products that contain one readily observable characteristic, hazardous inner courts, and absence of manufacturer label on both stock and custom window coverings. Staff further recommends that the Commission propose that a final rule become effective 30 days after publication in the Federal Register. Next. Now Mary is going to review the statutory framework for Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA related to the second proposed rule. Next slide. So the second NPR would create a mandatory consumer product safety rule for operating cords on custom window coverings. This draft rule proposes to require custom window coverings to meet the same operating cord requirements as stock products, meaning cordless and accessible cords for cords eight inches or shorter. Because the voluntary standard for operating cords on custom products allows for accessible long cords and would not prevent the strangulation hazard to young children, staff advised us that the commission use its authority under section seven and nine of the CPSA to create a mandatory standard. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements and requirements for warnings or, or instructions. These requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Next. Section 9 of the CPSA sets forth the process for a mandatory rule. Rules can begin with either an ANPR or an NPR. In this case, the Commission issued an ANPR in 2015. An NPR must contain the proposed regulatory text, describe any regulatory alternatives that the Commission considered, include a preliminary regulatory analysis, contain preliminary findings, and provide an opportunity for both oral and written comments. Next. Under Section 9, the preliminary regulatory analysis should describe the potential benefits and costs of the rule and who is likely to receive the benefits and bear the cost. The regulatory analysis should also explain why publishing a standard submitted to the Commission as part of the proposed rule, and the regulatory analysis should also discuss alternatives to the proposed rule and why these alternatives were not chosen. Next slide. Section 9 also requires that the Commission make several preliminary findings to issue the proposed rule, which are listed on this slide. And I'll just pause for a moment so you can review those. Next slide. Finally, Section 9 of the CPSA requires that when a voluntary standard has been adopted and implemented, as is the case here, to issue a mandatory rule, the Commission must find that either the voluntary standard is not likely to eliminate or adequately reduce the risk of injury, or the voluntary standard is unlikely that products substantially comply with it. Next slide. Now, Rana is going to explain how the information and staff's briefing package supports the requirement for the draft mandatory rule for operating cords on custom window coverings. Uh, next slide, please. 
As discussed before, staff believes that the requirements allowing hazardous operating cords on custom window coverings outlined in the ANSI standard are inadequate. All 30 of the 35 custom product operating cord incidents can still occur even if the custom product met the current standard. Next. Although the 2018 NCWCMA standard divides the window covering market into stock and custom products, incident scenarios are not based on WCMA's product distinction. Fatal and non-fatal injuries associated with window covering cords do not distinguish between stock and custom because both types of products essentially have the same hazard patterns. Next. Therefore, staff recommends that the operating cords for custom window coverings meet the same requirements as operating cords for stock window coverings as outlined in the NCWCMA 2018 standard. In addition, staff recommends adding the rigid cord shroud requirement based on the test method developed by the WCMA rigid cord shroud task group, but not yet balloted, be part of the rule. If the custom window covering uses a rigid cord shroud device, to comply with the rule, to clarify the meaning of the term rigid, the cord shroud would be tested to confirm that it remains rigid with the cord enclosed and is accordingly not hazardous to children. Next. Uh, next. Staff estimates that in 2019, approximately 139 million residential window coverings were shipped in the United States. We also estimate that about 44% of unit sales are custom products, and estimated 65% of custom products are corded custom products, which corresponds to about 39 million corded custom product shipments per year. Staff estimates that gross benefits attributable to addressing hazardous operating cords on custom window coverings would amount to about $49.5 million per year. Estimated costs are on the order of about $156 million to $309 million. However, staff's complex cost-benefit analysis uses estimated parameters, inputs from several models, assumptions based on export judgment, and public-private data in which there are likely to be many sources of uncertainty. These include the incremental cost of cordless products, the value of statistical life or VSL applicable to analyzing risks to children, the number of corded custom window coverings in use, and perhaps a longer average product life. Staff from Directorate for Economic Analysis have a detailed assessment of these uncertainties in the briefing package. One example is that a review of the literature conducted by the CPSC suggested that VSL for children could exceed that of adults by a factor of 1.2 to 3. If we substituted the high end of this range, which suggests that the VSL for children could be three times the VSL for adults, the estimated per unit benefit of the draft proposed rule would be higher and brings the expected benefits to about $137 million. Next. In developing the draft proposed rule, CPSC staff considered various alternatives. Staff does not believe that these alternatives will appropriately address the hazard, with the exception of longer effective date. The first alternative is to rely on the voluntary standard. Staff notes that WCMA did not agree with the recommendations from other stakeholders, including CPSC and consumer advocates, to require the stock product requirements for custom window coverings. Therefore, it is unlikely that an effective voluntary standard addressing the operating cord hazards on custom window coverings will be developed within a reasonable time frame. Second is to continue to participate and encourage safety improvements to the voluntary standard. Although staff supports recent changes in the voluntary standard for cordless, short cords, or inaccessible cords on stock products, Based on WCMA's rejection in the past of the idea 
to require the same compliance paths for custom and staff products, staff does not believe that WCMA is likely to improve the voluntary standard for custom products to a level that is equivalent to staff's recommendations for this rule. The third alternative, which staff already recommends, is to allow an effective date that is two years after the final rule is published in the Federal Register, which is 12 months longer than the default statutory provision. Given that there are some issues in redesigning certain window coverings of unusual size and accommodate a cordless operation, a later effective date would allow manufacturers more time to redesign and spread the research and development costs. Narrowing the scope to a limited number of product types, such as vertical blinds and curtains and draperies, was also considered. However, given the limited presence of vertical blinds in custom product incidents, only 5.7%, staff cannot recommend this option as it does not provide an effective reduction in injuries and deaths. Finally, continuing the information and education campaign was also considered Staff does not recommend relying solely on education campaigns to address the risk of injury. Next. Whenever an agency publishes a proposed rule, the Regulatory Flexibility Act requires that the agency prepare an initial regulatory flexibility analysis that describes the impact that the rule would have on small businesses and other entities. Unless the agency has a factual basis for certifying that the proposed rule will not have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities. Based on 2017 data, 1,840 of 1,898 firms were categorized as small blinds and shades manufacturers and retailers. In addition, there are about 83 small importers. CPSC staff expects the draft proposed rule to have a significant effect on a substantial number of small firms. To comply with the proposed rule, staff expects small manufacturers to incur redesign and incremental component costs for some product lines which currently are not available within accessible courts. Staff does not expect small manufacturers to suffer a disproportionate cost effect from the proposed rule. Staff expects small manufacturers of window coverings to incur, at a bare minimum, a 2% impact to their custom window covering revenue from the proposed rule. This implies that if custom products account for all of the firm's revenue, then the minimum impact of the proposed rule is 2% of the revenue. Generally, staff considers an impact to be potentially significant if it, if it exceeds 1% of firm's revenue. Because even the smallest estimate of cost is 2% of retail price, staff believes that the proposal could have a significant impact on manufacturers that receive a significant portion of their revenue from the sale of custom window coverings. Next. This draft proposed rule is intended to address the risk of injury and death posed by hazardous operating cords on custom window coverings. Staff believes that adherence to the requirements of the proposed rule will significantly reduce or eliminate a hidden hazard, strangulation deaths and injuries to children eight years and younger, in the future. Thus, the rule is in the public interest. Effective performance requirements for operating courts on window coverings are well known and already utilized for lower priced stock window coverings. Technologies to address hazardous window covering courts are also known and utilized on stock and custom products. Finally, consumers are likely willing to pay more for a custom window covering that eliminates the strangulation risk to children. Based on the foregoing, staff recommends that the Commission issue a draft proposed rule to require operating courts and custom window coverings to meet identical requirements for operating courts on stock window coverings as set forth in the Section 431 of NCWCMA 2018 standard. In addition, staff recommends issuing the proposed rigid court shroud requirement drafted by the staff that is based on the requirements developed by the WCMA task group. Finally, staff recommends an effective date of two two years following publication of the final rule in the Federal Register. Next. As stated earlier, we will now show a brief video that explains the observations to identify hazardous cords. This product is a horizontal blind with two operating pull cords on the right 
and two tilt cords on the left. Operating cords are used to raise or lower the blind. Tilt cords are used to adjust the slats. The inner cords connect the operating cords to the bottom rail. The length of both the operating pull cords and the tilt cords are longer than 8 inches. So if this were a stock product, due to the hazardous operating cords, the product would fail the standard. If this were a custom product, however, we would need to proceed with determining if the inner cords are accessible and hazardous. First, we determine if the inner cords are accessible using a cord accessibility probe. As you can see, the inner cords are accessible. Therefore, we now need to determine if a hazardous loop can be created. We apply a maximum of five pounds of pull force and pull the inner cord. While maintaining this opening, we then attempt to insert a head probe simulating the head size of a child with a maximum of 10 pounds of force. In lieu of the head probe, for simplicity, we can also measure the perimeter of a loop using a tape measure. Uh, this concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention, and we will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much for a very detailed, um, informative briefing. Um, so next is uh, I'll start with commissioners for myself and the other com commissioners. Um, I'll just start briefly. I think the, the presentation was, was very comprehensive. Um, my only real question is, and if the hazard patterns are the same um, for both stock and custom products, uh, why is there a ne uh, necessity to have different rules, separate rules uh, for the two um, for the two products? Well, I'll take that one if you want, Rana. Um, I think we addressed this in the uh, proposed rule. So our authorities are different based on whether there's an existing voluntary standard. So our section seven and nine authority, if there's a voluntary standard in place and it is effective to address the hazard and there's substantial compliance, we cannot uh, promulgate a consumer product safety rule. The CPSIA actually added an authority, section 15J, that allowed us to, for the commission, to by rule determine that the presence or absence of certain product characteristics are a substantial product hazard if there is a voluntary standard in effect and it's effective. So kind of the opposite finding. So that's why you have two different rules. The 15J would basically um, set a floor based on the voluntary standard for the operating cords and inner cords. So that's going to set a floor for products coming into the country based on the voluntary standards. But because the staff has assessed that the voluntary standard does not adequately address operating cords on custom products, we can't do a 15J rule for that hazard. We have to do a section seven and nine. And there we will be able to meet the requirement because um, we can say that the voluntary standard is not adequate to address that hazard. So it's appropriate to do a section seven and nine rule for that particular hazard. And I know that you covered this presentation, but just to confirm from your perspective, if we do a mandatory standard with respect to custom blinds, that will have uh, likely have an impact of decreasing the number of deaths of children associated with the custom blind coverings. Is that a fair representation of what you said? So staff doesn't believe that mandating the current custom product operating cord standards would be adequate, but we concluded that if the operating cord requirements for stock products were also required for custom products, then all operating cord incidents would have been addressed. 
this corresponds to about 86%, as much as 91% of custom product incidents. And about 9% is already addressed with the inner code requirements through Section 15J. Um, so we believe that the uh, applying or requiring the same requirements on operating cords for stock and custom would address all the injuries and deaths. Thank you. I don't have other questions at this point in time. Um, Commissioner Adler? Bob, you're uh, muted. Uh, okay, Steve, I, I had unmuted myself, but I needed Steve to unmute me. So, uh, good morning, uh, Rana and Mary. Thank you for excellent presentations as always. It's, all, it's a delight to see you. So, I'm going to put a question a little more bluntly than your very diplomatic response. The fact is that the reason we're having to do a Section 7 and 9 uh, mandatory standard is because WCMA and its members and the ASTM group won't change their operating cord requirements to conform to what the CPSC thinks is uh, essential to uh, promote safety. Am I, am I overstating that? Uh, I think that has been the case so far. Uh, there has been recent uh, activity on WCMA um, and they are planning to have a meeting uh, in early December to uh, reopen the standard and discuss custom product requirements. We can only hope that they'll change it because that would make life a lot easier for us to, to do it as part of a 15J rule. So uh, to the extent that uh, friends in WCMA are listening, uh, please take this as a request that you seriously reconsider and you uh, conform the operating court standard to uh, what the CPSC thinks is appropriate and to the stock requirement. Uh, one other quick question. I see that we are requiring uh, a rigid cord shroud standard uh, for the custom. Uh, do you think that that will then uh, be adopted by uh, WCMA and ASTM in the stock cord, I mean, excuse me, in the stock covering, window coverings standard? Yes, actually the uh, WCMA rigid cord shroud task group um, try to address it for um, both stock and custom products uh, and the language was developed to cover both types of products. So I I believe that it will be applicable to both. Okay, so uh, one of the big problems or the issues that I see is cost-benefit analysis, uh, and I thought you did a thoughtful cost-benefit analysis. Uh, one of the things that uh, you can find in the Consumer Product Safety Act Section 9 is not that the benefits, as measured in a very strict way, uh, exceed the cost, but that they bear a reasonable relationship to the cost. And I'm wondering, uh, and they, they also point out that uh, these can include non-quantifiable uh, costs or, or non-quantifiable calculations. Uh, how much did you include or should be included as a non-quantifiable aspect, the fact that it's such an incredibly hidden hazard? Uh, because it seems to me that, uh, and, and we've had people during our priority hearings explain that they were excruciatingly fastidious about childproofing their room and it never dawned on them that the cord could present a hazard. So it seems to me as a starting point, that would be one of those non-quantifiable elements that ought to be included uh, when we're uh, comparing benefits to cost. Was that taken into account? Should it be taken into account? Mary, you want to take that? Well, some of that discussion perhaps we can save for the executive session, but generally speaking, yes, staff did consider non-quantifiable benefits. And, and if I'm just uh, pursuing Section 15J, and you may want to answer this, but I think it's a pretty obvious one, uh, 15J does not require the same cost-benefit analysis that Section 7 and 9, mainly Section 9 does. Uh, it does apply the Regulatory Flexibility Act, but it does not apply the Section 9 cost-benefit analysis. Am I correct in stating that? That is correct. Uh, a 15J rule is uh, under Section 553 of the APA, so it's a notice and comment rulemaking that does not require cost-benefit analysis. And so this gets a little uh, beyond my uh, economic insight, but 
the classic uh, criticism of cost-benefit analyses, and I don't know whether this showed up in our injury cost model or not, is that it undervalues uh, kids and geezers like me. Um, because if you're looking at uh, lost wages, kids don't have wages, and somebody like me who's about to step into oblivion uh, doesn't have any wages. Does our assessment of the value of a statistical life uh, address that? Because it seems to me, it, I don't know that it does, because it's a, more of a willingness to pay cost-benefit standard. But uh, d was that element taken into account that children don't have wages and therefore may be valued less? Right, that is why um, the staff's analysis include a range for uh, VSL, because the VSL that they use in the base analysis is the EPA estimate, which includes the wage risk and stated preference studies that focus on individuals' willingness to pay, but they are difficult to apply to children, like you said. That is why they considered an alternate approach for altruistic preferences of people, and based on the co collected studies that they have found, um, that the valuation of risk to children uh, could be 1.22 to three times higher. Um, so people are willing to pay that much more to mi mitigate the risk for children. And that is why we have that uh, range in our estimates. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. I, I would make the argument that it ought to apply for a variety of reasons. First of all, the victims uh, of window cords are not adults. The victims are children. And so that would argue for paying particular attention to valuing children's lives uh, more highly. And uh, I guess the second point, a couple other points, our policy on priorities specifically says that uh, in setting priorities, we need to play higher priority on vulnerable populations, which obviously would include children. So it seems to me that that shows a great emphasis uh, on protecting kids. One of the other points I would make just in passing is an observation. If you look at the number of safety standards the agency has, the vast majority of them apply to children. That shows how much we value, and I think we reflect society, how much society values uh, children's lives. So I would argue for the higher number as well. Uh, at any rate, um, I really do appreciate the uh, the analysis and the presentation that you did. Excellent as always. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Biacco. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Raina and Mary, for a thorough presentation. I, I actually I don't have any questions. I know that's very rare for me, but I don't. So thank you very much. As, as yesterday, I would say it's a high compliment to the staff to covered everything so well, which I agree with Commissioner Biacco on. Uh, Commissioner Fielden, uh, Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it's exciting to be back just one day after we did a briefing on magnets. This is uh, another sign that we're returning to some sense of normalcy after so much tumult. And I, I want to thank the chairman for scheduling this briefing session. Um, I, I appreciate the hard work staff has put into the briefing materials. And while some of my questions are uh, related to the general counsel's legal memo, which I will defer for our next session so we can discuss privileged matters confidentially, I do have several questions for staff uh, that are appropriate here in open session. So I, I would start with an observation. I'm frustrated that we haven't made progress with regard to custom window coverings. And my questions for this open session are directed to exploring why that's the case. Um, and I, this is for, for, for Rana and Mary. Can, can you provide a brief historical overview of how we got to where we are today? For my benefit and for others who uh, may not have all of the background, given that this is an issue with such a long history. So in, in particular, why was a voluntary standard for stock window coverings implemented and, customs window, and custom window coverings not? Um, WCMA's uh, decision about differentiating stock and custom products uh, were mainly based on making the products that are sold the most in terms of unit sales the safest, and they thought that it would be quickest to implement compared to custom products. But they made a commitment to reopen the custom product, 
to reopen the standard to work on custom products pretty much immediately after the standard passed. Uh, however, in the meantime, uh, there has been a development in Canada. Uh, Canada has a regulation for uh, covering all window coverings. So that got their main uh, attention and they had to work and try to interpret and work towards meeting those requirements because that standard in fact went into effect in 2021, but they have a one year of kind of a grace period due to COVID-19. Um, so that delayed the process of reopening the standard here because they basically used the same technical resources to work on Canada as well as US standard. I understand. I appreciate that. But I'm not sure why uh, Canadian development should have any bearing on commitments that were made to the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. But putting that aside, CPSC, uh, among other things, is charged with ensuring the safety of the elderly and those with physical disabilities or, or mobility issues. Um, could, could one of you please discuss how the proposed standard for custom window coverings would address concerns of, of these and other communities who might face frankly, unintended consequences flowing from the proposed rule as drafted? So we have looked at what type of tools or mechanisms uh, available for um, elderly population as well as people on wheelchairs. And we have um, found a number of products such as extension rods or, um, uh, or wands to make it easier for elderly or uh, disabled population to operate the blind or the shade and also note that the motorized systems are becoming more popular and um, having a lower cost, including DIY kits. Um, so we believe that there are either um, tools that um, the special population can use or may choose a um, motorized system to meet their needs. That's a helpful answer. Thank you. Uh, could you also walk us through the analysis of, of how this draft rule imposes the least burdensome requirements uh, that, that prevent or adequately reduce the risk of injury. Could a voluntary standards address these concerns with regard to custom window coverings? Is that is that even within the realm of possible? So the fact that the voluntary standard allows custom products to have long cords is the problem because for stock products, the, all the options that the stock products can meet are safe. Either no cords, short cords, or inaccessible cords. Custom products can have these, but customers have the option of choosing a long hazardous cord in their system, in their operating system. And we don't believe that while having these options available uh, will make this standard safer for custom products. So that is why we believe that applying the same requirements for stock and custom are feasible, uh, technologically feasible, and implemented already in the stock market. Okay, that makes sense. I, I wanna ask about some of the data that's underpinning our analysis here. Uh, WCMA has told me that, that two thirds of the IDIs that they reviewed would not have occurred if the current standard on, on custom window coverings had been in place at the time. Uh, but on the other hand, starting on slide 17 of the presentation that you just gave, uh, staff has found that all 30 incidents involving uh, custom products uh, could still occur even if the products complied with the voluntary standard. So I would welcome staff's views on WCMA's assertion um, because it appears to me that you're both saying very different things right now. Um, it is possible um, because I guess when the IDIs are redacted, it is difficult to differentiate whether the product is a custom or a stock product because the brand name is um, hidden. Uh, so we have more information to make a determination in terms of whether the incident blind was stock or custom or what type of cord caused the incident. So maybe within their limited um, IDI information, that is their conclusion, but when we look at all the IDIs and the information available to us, uh, that's the conclusion uh, we were able to reach. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, I will reserve my other questions for the executive session. 
but this was a, uh, a very comprehensive overview. Thank you for all your work on this and for everything you all do at the agency. And Mr. Chairman, thank you again for scheduling this. Uh, thank you to uh, you and all the commissioners. Um, and thank you to staff for this very informative briefing. At this point in time, we are going to uh, close the public briefing and move to the executive session. Uh, so uh, we are finished. Thank you. <laughs>